Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, we would like to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Amna, and I'm with my uh, thesis partner, Lynn. We both are currently studying masters in e-business at Copenhagen Business School. So right now we are writing our thesis and our thesis is to is exploration of workplace trainings and their impact on organizational performance or learning outcomes. Moreover, our program is about um, integrate specifically focusing on technology aspects. So alongside how trainings evolve in organizations, we are also interested in if organizations are using technologies and how they are using those technologies. So that's why we have requested you if you could um, give give us your uh, perspective towards learning and development and we found out that you have a, you have a good experience in this field so i think we are going to learn a lot from you so if you could introduce yourself and we can start it and thank you for joining us sure so my name is guy wallace i have been in the training and development, now known as learning and development field since 1979. So I've been doing this for 44 years. Um, I just recently retired a couple of months ago due to my wife's uh, health issues. And I I'm 71 years old, so it's about time for me to retire anyway. But uh, I've been a consultant uh, to major corporations and government uh, agencies since 1982. I've had over 80 clients. Uh, I've uh, been a partner in three different consulting firms. Uh, the first two, uh, over 20 years, uh, I had a staff between 15 and 25 people. Uh, in my third consulting business, I'm a solo entrepreneur. And so I've been uh, doing solo consulting, if you will, and bringing in uh, my, people from my network, my professional network, uh, since 2002. So uh, again, I've been in, I was oriented in this business uh, to what some might call a performance orientation. I've been doing performance-based instruction or training and learning uh, since basically day one getting out of college. I have a radio TV film degree. And after I graduated from college in 1979, I went to work for my employer. I was working part time as a student, as a salesperson in basically a lumber center, selling uh, uh, lumber products and uh, kitchen cabinets and things like that. But uh, so I went to the headquarters after I graduated because they were in the process of converting all of their training from 35 millimeter slides with audio tracks to video. And since I had a video degree, they wanted to bring me into their 10 person training organization, but they didn't put me into the department that, that created the training. They put me into the program development department where I conducted analysis and design, wrote scripts, uh, produced storyboards, and then handed all of that off to the three-person unit we had to produce videos, and then I supported them as they produced videos. So I've been involved, if you will, in that kind of technology approach, video way back in the day, uh, which is becoming, again, more popular due to the uh, availability of the internet and allowing us to deploy that kind of content uh, individually to learners and, in, and as groups. Thank you. Um, so, um, since um, so, first of all, we would like to know. Thank you so much for your uh, brief introduction. And since we are going to touch upon um, eight constructs that we are exploring, first of all, if you could give us general overview of learning and development department and how strategies are being developed, and if you could give us examples of workplace trainings. Um. Okay, I've been uh, involved in workplace training. That's been my specialty, my, my what I would call enterprise L&D 
versus educational L&D because learning and development is applicable in an educational system as well as in enterprise, which could be a corporation, government agencies, et cetera. So workplace training, to me, training uh, suggests that people will have a new ability, capability, or competence once it's done. They won't just know things. They will know how to do things. And that's been the orientation that I've had. So I've developed uh, labor relations training for new supervisors for Illinois Bell, as an example, where we taught them how to uh, conduct labor relations on the front end, dealing with their employees, adhering to their contractual obligations, uh, what to do if there were performance issues and still abide by their contractual obligations. Um, if they if they um, had to go into arbitration uh, with, against the union, uh, et cetera, you know, how do they handle themselves into that? So it was very performance oriented in terms of how to do that. And then because we understood what people had to do, we could teach them what they had to know so that their performance, their task performance that produced outputs you know, were consistent with stakeholder requirements, the law, con contractual kinds of things, company policies and procedures, et cetera. I've also developed training, a series of training for AT&T product managers. This was back in the mid 80s uh, after our telephone company, AT&T, was no longer a monopoly and they were going to have to start competing. So I went to work for what was the manufacturing arm of AT&T used to be Western Electric. At that time, it was AT&T Network Systems, but they built all the equipment for the telephone systems for global applications. Our clients were global. And uh, I helped product managers manage products through the various life cycles um, from brand new idea and a concept uh, through uh, development of that product or service and or service um, to uh, uh, releasing it to the marketplace, to ramping up their ability to meet the demand. Uh, then it, when it leveled off, how to manage their manufacturing such products so that they didn't overproduce beyond the demand. And then when the product was going to be replaced by newer technologies, how did they uh, take that product into decline and to actually ending its availability, uh, depending on what their contractual. So workplace training to me is all about um, helping people learn to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And when people's outputs or products that they produce meet those stakeholder requirements, you get a good outcome. If they don't meet the requirements, then that's a bad outcome. So outcomes are ultimately how stakeholders, such as the government, regulators, customers, suppliers, employees, uh, how they look at whether or not what you're producing is adequate to their needs, whether it meets their needs or not. And so that's the focus of performance-based instruction or training or learning. Thank you. So do you think that um, since at workplace, it's training is more need based and asynchronous um, compare if you compare it with high education context? So how much do you think it is difficult to develop training modules and how much difficult? How much do you think that um, stakeholders are satisfied after workers have been trained? Well, it's you know, if I talk to that, I'll have to be generalizing because there's people who do absolutely stellar work and there's people who don't do such good work. In terms of, you know, the return on investment, if a company invests money in training, they should get a return. So that return usually comes because people are performing better, faster, and cheaper. Um, so I'm not sure that I understood your question exactly. Uh, so Help me out with that a little bit. Um, uh, we are basically thinking about when we were reviewing literature, we, we understood that it's more about personalized training uh, programs since and how 
it depends upon if you have to train someone who is working in sales departments and it depends upon someone who requires technical training and someone who requires um, soft skills training. So how do you analyze the needs? Uh, what kind of training is required? And secondly, when we uh, refer the literature, change is the most difficult thing. So how do you think that people are willing to change themselves? Well, I think change is tough for a lot of people, but they then, in fact, they change all the time. They're changing maybe daily or weekly. Um, so what people are, my experience, my opinion about this is that people are sometimes worried that changes will take them from being competent to incompetent. If I'm competent in doing the job right now today and you're going to change it, I don't know whether that's a smart change or a stupid change and whether I'm going to be able to make the change myself. So I might be a little bit hesitant or fearful about this potential change um, because I worry about my own ability to be competent. Uh, my ego demands that perhaps I, I be competent. But, you know, when training should be looking at first the performance not what we think people need to know but what we they need to do and produce and once we understand that so you mentioned sales and technical training and soft sales training so sales well you need to understand the sales process you need to understand you know what people need to know how to do now to personalize that we need to know exactly what their job assignment is because perhaps they're a salesperson like another salesperson, but they serve different markets. They, they, they sell different products in the same company and they may have the same job title, but they do different things. And so that's one of the variances that we need to understand. What's the variability in people's job assignments? And then the second variability that we need to understand is that people come into a job or a new job or whatever, and they bring prior knowledge. They bring existing knowledge and skills. And so we should not be training people on things that they already know. So if I already know how to do active listening, you can skip that for me and give that to somebody who doesn't know how to do active listening in a sales environment. And active listening in a sales environment is different than active listening in a, perhaps a technical environment. There's a core to active listening, but the application of active listening is different in a sales context than in a technical context. And so we need to understand the performance context, the tasks that are required, the outputs that are to be produced. And when we look at tasks, well, there's, in my view, there's two kinds of tasks. There's the behavioral tasks that we can see and observe, and there's the cognitive tasks, the thinking tasks, that we cannot see and observe. So one of the things that we need to package in our learning and development or training products is how to think about the performance that we're training people to do. And so that's very tough. Soft skills, this has been an issue since I got into the business back in the late 70s. And soft skills, uh, according to the late Joe Harless, soft skills are hard skills out of context. So we take something like active listening or good communication skills or questioning skills or listening skills, et cetera, et cetera. And if we don't understand the context that people need to perform and use that skill in, well, we're teaching generic content. We're not teaching people how to apply it in their jobs. And that's been a huge issue in the training and development and learning development profession since long before I got into the into the uh, business. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now moving forward, um, if you can guide us about learning uh, theories or designs, like uh, while developing these training initiatives, do you apply any theory um, for? like AD model or Kirkpatrick's learning model, learning theories? I subscribe to the learning theories and approaches that I learn that can be credited back to the late Gary Rumler and the late Tom Gilbert, the late Bob Mager, and the late Joe Harless. These were four individuals that were uh, well-known in the United States 
back in the 1960s and 70s in the training and development profession. And so our focus is on performance. So my own learning theory is that I need to provide people with an advanced organizer about what they're going to learn, how that's applicable, how it's going to use things that they already know. And then I'm going to put them through the minimal information that's necessary. I may show them a demonstration of what we want them to learn how to do. And then I'm going to put them into an application exercise, otherwise known as practice with feedback. And my goal has always been to get people into practice and feedback, the application exercises, as soon as possible. So I'm always trying to minimize what information I give people. This is a, a big issue in our business. We give too much information. We overload people's cognitive abilities to absorb that information. And then all too often, we don't show them what performance looks like, what good performance looks like, what bad performance looks like. And then we don't give them adequate practice with feedback. Too often, training, learning programs, if they have practice and feedback, do it one time, one and done. And if I were to practice something that's new, I probably didn't get it perfect. And so I should be given feedback, reinforcing feedback on what I did well, corrective feedback on what I didn't do so well. And that feedback should be given to me, ideally, just before I practice again. So it's fresh in my mind. And I should try to you know, re do what I did well and correct the things that I didn't do so well. And so my bias in performance-based training is that on the things that are really critical and difficult to learn, because not everything is, but the things that are difficult, we need to give adequate practice and feedback to people. And in fact, supporting transfer back to the job, we may need to give their supervisors practice exercises that the supervisor could give to me to continue my development back out on the job. Thank you. Um, now, um, we would like to ask you about technology since um, you know how there, there is a perspective of providing on-site trainings and then now the trend has been um, shifted towards um, te te applying technology because people are more busy focusing on their jobs. So companies are using technologies. So if you have some knowledge about how companies are using technologies for learning and development, uh, just a general overview. Yeah. So again, this is one thing that it's really hard to generalize because there are people that are not using technology very much, although that's ultimately going to change, I believe. Uh, and there's people who have been are comfortable with using technologies too. But, but since I've been in the business since 1979, one of the things I've been saying the last few years is that what technology has done for the people in our profession, learning and development, is it is helps us uh, do our work, administrate our work, and deploy our work. And that's been a moving target. Things have been changing. I started off doing video on VHS cassette tapes, uh, and all the places where the training was to be used had the uh, video player and a TV monitor, and we started deploying content via that kind of technology. But 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 that was you know, now we have the internet. Now we can send videos to individuals, or they can go source those videos themselves. And so technology has a huge role in the workplace. But one of the things that when I think about using technology is that I want to reflect in, in when I'm doing training. Um, I want the training environment, the learning environment, to reflect as much as it can the performance environment. So if people are working on uh, cross-functional teams, then I want to train people in, in cross-functional teams. It may be the real cross-functional team. It may be a made-up cross-functional team just for learning purposes. But I want to replicate that environment so that will help with transfer because it'll be more familiar when you get back to the environment and it's the same as how you learn to, to uh, uh, learn how to perform. So technology can help us with that. But, but nowadays, 
people are working remote. They're working with cross-functional teams um, uh, that are in different locations. And so we're using tools like Zoom and Microsoft Teams in order to conduct our work. Well, the training can should then use that because that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to do my work. I should learn how to do it that way. So the technology should help with that. But I think there's also another missing piece here in that not everything that people need to learn needs to be training. Now, when I started in 1979, I, the very first day I was given a, a little newsletter from 1970 that talked about guidance. And at the time in 1979, nine years later, that was already known as job aids. And it soon became known as performance support or electronic performance support and or, or workplace learning. So there's all these different names for this, but I can give people a resource, a checklist, a step-by-step -step guideline, diagrams with you step-by-step know, -step instructions like that. Like when you build a bookcase or a bookshelf and it comes disassembled and you have to assemble it, there's instructions there on how to produce that. So that's one form of instruction. And that is much cheaper to create and to deploy and to use than forcing people to go through some sort of a group training session or individual or an e-learning program. So too often, um, we don't just simply provide people that guidance or performance support that they might need. We force them into training and that might be overkill in the extreme. So especially when we when we look at the performance context when you're in a job you need to ask when you're studying a job to build instruction or training for that you need to understand whether or not that performance can be performed using some sort of reference can i look at some guidance and follow that is does the performance context allow for a referenced performance response or does that performance context demand a memorized performance response? If I'm working on uh, in an ambulance as part of an ambulance team, there are things that I have to know. I cannot look them up because I'm working to save a life perhaps. And there's no time to look things up. So there are things that we need to know. We have to memorize those things. And there's other things that we can look up. And so we in the business of providing help to performers who are learners, we need to help them perform. And we need to do this at the least cost and the least inconvenience. So that's one thing that we need to use is use technology to create and deploy performance guides or job aids, or we can create a learning experience and we can use technology to deploy that. Um, but but we have to be careful about uh, one of the phrases that I learned back in, I think I was still in college, but a high tech world needs high touch. We are social beings. We are social animals and we crave that connectedness with other people. Now, I'm overgeneralizing there because there are introverts and extroverts and et cetera. But, but we need to take that into consideration that there is a need for people to get together and they have a desire to learn from each other. Now, what we have to be careful about is that you can learn from me, but you could learn erroneous things. I might not have it right. I might teach you, help you learn things that are improper, illegal, or just inefficient. And so we have to be careful about how we uh, help people master performance with things that are right, that are correct, that are true, not things that are myths, et cetera. Thanks. Um, now, if you could also guide us about um, key performance indicators, um, and if you could also give us some examples, how, how do you measure the effectiveness of these training initiatives? Yeah, so when you're looking at effectiveness, you're looking at before and after. So if, you, if you're brought in to help develop training, to help a group improve, you need to understand what their performance is when you start. 
And then you can look at well, what's the performance after we've trained them. And, you know, the, depending on the performance that you're looking at, say, say we're talking about you have script writers who turn it over to people that are going to produce storyboards, and then you're going to turn that over to people who are going to produce e-learning, storyboarding. So what are the measures of performance for storyboarding? Well, they're basically revolve around what the quality movement would have said, better, faster, and cheaper, quality, quantity, and cost. And so we can look at, well, what, how long is it taking us now to produce a storyboard? And I'll make something up and I'll say, it takes three days. Well, we got some people who are doing it in one day and we have other people that are doing it in five days. So doing it in one day is possible. Can we get people to do it in one day? What are the what what are the people doing who are doing it in one day versus the three or five? And so we can begin to look at those key process or performance indicators. But but too often, going back into the 1980s, key process or performance indicators are ignored by a lot of the top performers, what I call master performers, what the late Tom Gilbert called exemplar performers. And too often KPIs are put together by a group who really doesn't understand the performance. And so they kind of create, this is how we're gonna measure performance, but it's not very well done. And so I've had master performers, the top of their profession, come together in my analysis efforts and tell me, we ignore those KPIs guy, because if we followed them, we wouldn't be as good as we are. And this was a challenge for my clients, especially if they were in the room listening to this. They're cringing because their top people are saying, we ignore those measures because those aren't the right measures. If you want to know what the right measures are, Guy, we'll tell you. And so I capture that kind of data because I'm trying to train people to be like the best that we already have. And so if we have top performers, we need to know how are they doing that and what can we extract from what they're doing and help others learn to do their work better and faster and cheaper. So KPIs are, are something that I think it's good. We should understand how we measure performance and how we measure performance should be how we measure our training's effectiveness. Now we can look at we can get people to perform uh, instead of five days to two and a half days or two days, and that's good. And that, that maybe not the one day, which was the top where we were aiming for, but we can make people much more effective in doing that. Um, but is our training efficient? So our training should be effective first, efficient second. So, but too often, those in learning and development are focused on making their content efficient, quick, as quick as possible, micro learning, when in fact that may not be enough. So learning, micro learning or macro learning, whatever it is, needs to be uh, as long as possible, uh, as long as necessary, but as short as possible. So as long as necessary to get people to be able to master that performance, to go back to the job so they're prepared for the job. Uh, and But too often we're worried about making everything short and quick in that, and it may not be adequate. And so we skip another practice exercise. We only give them one, we don't give them two and three. And so we're making our content, we think efficient, but we're impacting the effectiveness of that content. So that's a tough balance here. So. I would always go, and my clients would normally agree with this, make it effective first, because that's what they want, effective performers out on the job. And we'll work on the efficiency. And the efficiency can be helped when you take a performance orientation so that you can ensure that the essential content is in your product and that the extraneous content has been extracted and eliminated. Too often we don't, people putting together learning and development products don't know what the job really requires. So they go after topics or competencies or knowledge or skills, but they don't know how to skinny that down. They don't know how to reduce that content to the bare essentials. And we too often give too much content to learners. And again, that buries them. That just creates cognitive overload. 
Thank you. Um, now, if you could also advise us about impact assessments, uh, overall evaluation of training initiative, how they impact organizational performance, or what measures you use for impact assessments? Well, um, so ideally, your client is already measuring performance out on the job. They know how fast they are, uh, how good they are quality-wise, better, faster, cheaper, and they know what their costs are. And so if you're trying to improve that, you need to understand, well, what's the potential? Can I, can I do a storyboard in uh, two hours? When most people are taking three days and some are taking five, but some people can get it down in one. So uh, when I'm measuring performance, I need to understand what's the baseline? Where are we at right now today? What have those numbers been? What's the trend? If I said that people are doing it in three days, well, I need to know that there's a range there. Some people are doing it one to five and it averages to three. So that's an average. So I need to understand the current state measures that we are trying to impact. When a client comes to us, they may want it all. They may want it better, faster, and cheaper. And we need to understand, well, are those feasible? And we should be willing to help our clients. We can't make promises if it's impossible to do, but we can help our clients measure our, uh, the impact of our training initiatives. But it's but too often, and this has been true for decades and decades, too often training organizations report out training or learning activities. They're not they're not reporting out. Here's how your people are doing better, faster, and cheaper. They've gone from producing things on an average of three days to down to one and a half days. So the business cares about their business metrics and they care less about our learning metrics. So we worry about engagement. We worry about um, um, uh, how many people we've trained. Um, and those are interesting if we're not getting the results that we want. So when we measure our impact in enterprise learning and development, we need to be looking at the people back on the job and how is their performance different than it was before they did the training. And if they were, if they come out of training, they go to the job, they're performing at one level. Well, what's it like in two or three weeks or two or three months? Are they continuing to do better or have they peaked and start, it has their performance degraded? Has it started to deteriorate from the peak that they achieved? Well, why is that? And so we need to understand, you know, what that performance is when we start, what the, were the numbers going up or down? Were they all over the place? Were they trending down? Were they trending up? Because the data of what, you know, per, what the performance was beforehand we can't look at that in isolation, one number that represents everything before. So we need to understand what was the performance like before, and if we've had an impact, what has it been? Now, I have a, a story to tell you that some story that was uh, told to me back in the 80s at a conference, and a sales organization had changed their sales process. And the training group stepped up and developed the training about the new sales process. And they trained everybody really well. And when the client, the sales organization, looked at what was happening with their sales, what they found out was that the new sales process took twice as long as the old one, which meant their revenues were half of what they used to be. So they quit the new sales process immediately. Well, we could have predicted that. They could have predicted that if they had tested their new training with a, a, a targeted group and in isolation and train them to see what the results were. Instead, they trained everybody immediately on this new process and they didn't realize that this was going to wreak havoc on their sales revenues. Um, it's, it's kind of a funny story, but it was uh, uh, critically difficult for those people that were involved in the training organization. They were embarrassed that they, they were part of that, but they were doing what their client had asked them to do. Thank you. So um, moving forward, uh, if you could also give us um, learners' perceptions, um, employees, while they are being given trainings, how much they are willing to be a part of these training initiatives? Um, I, I think that um, my experience is that, that I've, 
I've been doing training for a long time, like I said. And uh, so I've heard from the learners what they thought about the training that we produced that was performance-based. And it was refreshing to them because this taught them how to do their jobs. In the past, too often, they were taught on topics, topics that were sounded reasonable. They had face validity, but they didn't have performance validity. You can teach me active listening and tell me that I'm going to be using that in my job. But if you don't teach me how to use active listening in my job tasks, then you're expecting me to figure that out when I get back to the job. And I may struggle with that and I may give up. So I, my experience is that learners who are performers, once they realize that what they're being taught is authentic, it reflects the job requirements that they have, then they are willing to participate in it. But all too often, they're given what I might call educational programs that teach you about this topic or that topic or this competency, but it's not real. It's not authentic enough. It sounds good, and I may be really excited taking it, but once I've taken it and go back to the job, I realize that it's not doing me any good at all. And so the feedback that I've been given and my clients have been given from their learners is that when you, when the training or learning reflects the authentic performance requirements, people are happy to take it. They're even okay with learning things that they already knew because now they can see what they knew in the new performance context. They can see how to leverage what they already know in the new performance context. Um, but so I think that uh, when your training or instruction is performance-based, learners really appreciate that because likely they've experienced non-performance-based instruction. Um, managers are happy because they see people coming back to the job and able to perform better. Um, and managers, clients that pay for all of this, they're happy because they can see that they've gotten a return on investment. Now, if they chose the wrong content, the wrong performance to focus on, they may not get a, a, a return that's sufficient to their needs. But so that's part of it is our collaboration with our clients and helping them um, really narrow in on the performance that's that requires instruction or training or learning and to uh, do address that in the most cost effective means. Performance aids or job aids are a lot cheaper than training pro programs or learning experiences. And so there's a time and a place for both. And we need to help our clients understand that and take advantage of that. Thank you. Um, lastly, we also would like to know about challenges and opportunities. Um, uh, with how, what challenges do you think learning and development has and what opportunities according to your perspective you see in this area in the future well i think the challenge is <laughs> I, I could point you to a video of the late gary rumler at motorola in 1981 where he outlines a lot of these challenges and that is too often our training or learning content doesn't really focus on the performance requirements. They focus on enabling knowledge and skills, um, but they don't teach those knowledge and skills in context. So that's really the big challenge. Another challenge is that we are often uh, directed to create content that is the equivalent of one size fits all. So I teach everybody about active uh, learning, active listening. And they know how to do active listening and they know what it is, but they don't know how to do it in their jobs. And so, again, they may struggle with that because every job it could be slightly different or vastly different in terms of how you apply that. So the challenge is to get away from one size fits all education. And that means focusing in uh, more narrowly on performance and knowledge and skills that relate to that performance. And that costs more. And there, when you produce something like that, it has a smaller audience. If you created active listening training, well, that's good for everybody in the company. I mean, who doesn't need active listening? But active listening in a sales context is for salespeople, people in purchasing or finance or manufacturing or merchandising, 
all these other functions, well, that would not be performance based for them because it was intended for salespeople to reflect as closely as you can get to the authentic performance requirement in the sales process. And so we need to get away from the one size fits all. And that's our major challenge to focus on the performance requirements of narrower audiences, target audiences. And then, so that's both a challenge and an opportunity because if we do that, we'll get better returns on our investments. We'll have more effective uh, instructional content. Uh, learners will be happy because they will be prepared by their companies to be successful. If you join a company and they give you some training, but it really doesn't help you master your job, that can become very frustrating. And there's not that many people who will stay in a frustrating job where they feel incompetent. They will leave. I did a project back in the late uh, 90s for Bank of America. And my client didn't even tell me this. I didn't even know about this for 11 years. Uh, they wrote a, a, uh, a recommendation for me on LinkedIn where they mentioned this. And that, I, that was the first time I saw it 11 years later. And But they reduced turnover to 35% because the training that I helped them put together was performance-based, performance-focused, and it helped bank tellers learn how to do their job. It wasn't a topic about this or that or these other things. It was these topics and how to apply them in your work processes. And so because the exit interviews before I did my work uh, were indicating to them that people were leaving the job because they didn't feel competent. They didn't feel prepared for the job. They were frustrated because they didn't know how to do their job. And customers would be on the other side of the counter yelling at them. Nobody likes that. So you'd want to be competent so you could do the job, serve the customer, make them satisfied, and then go on to the next customer. But too often when we when we feed people topics and concepts and things, but we don't teach them how to integrate it into their task performance, we don't prepare them for success. We're really, unfortunately, preparing them for failure. And not too many people can deal with that. So I think that there's this whole notion of focusing on performance to improve performance back out on the job. And my my buy is that if we create performance-based training and have practice exercises that are authentic, just like the real work, that's engaging. That's going to be engaging to people. But we're trying to create engaging content that isn't really performance relevant or people can't see how it's performance relevant. They may think, yeah, that could be performance relevant, but I'm not sure that what I'm learning is performance relevant. But they have me doing this and they have me doing that. Oh, it's very engaging. Well, engagement, engaging content is a measure of the learning, not of the performance. So if we wanna look at, well, why are our performance, we've trained people, they're not performing any better. We need to start looking at, well, why is that? Is it because the training was boring? or perhaps it really is that it was a performance oriented. So we've got this mania, this focus on engaging content as if that's going to save the reputation of the training organization and its products and services. And I don't think it will. Thank you. Um, lastly, we would like your uh, input. Like uh, Both of us are interested in working and learning and developing future. So how could we improve our skills or what things that we can study so we can be a part of this community? And thank you for your um, interview because uh, we really have, you have given us good insight into how trainings at Workplace happens and the aspect that you talked about performance-based trainings was very good for us to know that trainings need to be performance and need to be personalized, yeah. Yeah. So you're most welcome. Um, so I think that, you know, the, this, what I've been talking about is not new. Uh, almost everything I've been talking about, I learned in 1979. And I learned things in 1979 that people had been doing back in the 1960s. So this is not new. And there are fortunately some, there's not a lot, but there are some, um, 
materials, videos, audios, uh, articles, books, etc., by people who were really focused on performance. And if you want to go work in a company, in an enterprise, and perform learning and development, I think that there are all sorts of things in educational programs that are good. They'll teach you all about design. They'll teach you about development tools, et cetera. They'll teach you how to uh, facilitate learning when it's in a group forum. Um, and so those are all good things. What's missing from my perspective, as somebody who has been hiring instructional designer folks since 1982, um, I want people who know how to do the analysis and do it well and do it very quickly because most clients have not seen a lot of value add from the analysis efforts and outputs. And so we as a field need to do much better in doing performance analysis, understanding what the enabling knowledge and skills are, et cetera. So analysis is really key. And there are a lot of different models. I have mine, there are others. Uh, and you should focus in on learning how to do that upfront analysis. Uh, another aspect I think is project planning and management. So to me, this is a big deal. I, as an external consultant, had to bid on projects and I had to price those projects and I needed to make sure that I didn't go bankrupt because every one of my projects lost money. I had to make money for my companies. And so I needed, so one of the keys I think to that is really understanding uh, having a project management framework that helps people uh, estimate better. When can I have the analysis done? When will I be done with the design? When will you be done with development? When will we release this to the target audience? Clients want to know that pretty much on day one. And so I ha had to develop my own um, estimating guidelines so that if they talk to me about a project that they hadn't given me yet, but they wanted to know when is it going to be done and how much is it going to cost me? And if I couldn't tell them that, then I was not likely to get the, the work. So I think project planning and management of instructional design projects is key and critical. Conducting analysis is key and critical. And then there's something way before all of that, and that's just client relations. Um, who, how to work with your clients and stakeholders and understand things from their business perspective. And then learning how to speak in the language of the business. And every business you go to has a different set of jargon and terminology, et cetera, that you need to learn. And we should not try to teach our clients what we do, how we do it, and how it's so wonderful. They don't care. We need to talk in their language. We need to explain what we need to do, what we need from them, how we should collaborate in a project plan, and then conduct the project. And if we're focused on performance and we understand what people need to be able to do and what they need to know to be able to do it, then we'll serve all of our stakeholders well. The learner, who is a performer, first and last. Second, their managers. And third, our clients and stakeholders at the top of the enterprise. Thank you. Um, thank you for your uh, kind time. And we are going to focus on these areas and how to, to get into this area.